speaking to you from Edinburgh in Scotland, where I live now. Uh, Scotland is a member of the United Kingdom as it is <laughs> at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I have about an hour to work with you on the ideas of host leadership this morning. And uh, this is a work that is contained in my book, Host, uh, which came out nearly five years ago. Uh, we're going to work with some of the main pieces of this today. We can't work with all of it, but we're going to work with the metaphor of leading as a host. There's also a lot of more detail in here, but we'll make an impactful hour of uh, getting you thinking about your own situations and your own leadership challenges and connecting that with the metaphor of leading as a host. Uh, in general, if you have questions, just wave your arms around and, and we'll, we'll find a way to help you ask your question. Uh, I've got a couple of activities for you to do during the next hour. So you won't all be sitting and listening to me. Oh, wow, there's a whole load more people. Yeah, the that was okay. one. Yeah. Oh, I recognize that lady in the front row. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We have always <laughs> yeah, a lot of people. Excellent. Well, it's good to see. It's good to be with you all. Um, so let's begin. Uh, the first question as a host leader is this. Are you going to step forward or step back next? Are you going to step forward or step back next? Uh, we all know that leadership can look like stepping forward, coming out front, doing something, attracting attention. But I want to introduce to you the idea today that leadership can also look like stepping back. And when we step back, we create space for other people to step forward. So it's a bit like a dance. It's a dance of engagement, a dance that we use to engage people to work with us, because that's what I think the art of leadership is about, the art of engaging people to work with us, stepping forward and stepping back in a dance. Now, we're going to look at how that works over the next uh, few minutes. Um, I first came across this idea of leading as a host in 2003. I was in a seminar given by Matthias Varga von Kibet. Some of you may know Matthias Varga. And he was talking about hosting leadership, uh, hosting family constellations. And he said at one point, there's an old Arabic proverb, he said, the host is both the first and the last. The host is both the first and the last. And I thought immediately, well, that's the leader, isn't it? The leader is the first and the last. The leader is the one who steps forward to lead the way, but also is the last. And the image that was in my mind was the, the ship's captain, the famous image of the ship's captain being the last to leave the sinking ship because he had made or she had made sure of the safety of everybody else. And I think this is a very powerful idea. How can we both be both the first and the last and that that idea set me up onto uh, what's now been uh, nearly two decades of work and research and thinking and trying things out with this metaphor of the host as a leader. Uh, so we've got two ideas so far. We've got stepping forward and stepping back, and we've got being the first and being the last. So those are two very big ideas. Before we go further, I just want to have a little check-in with you about the, what you're doing and what your interest is in, in leadership. So if you work with an organization, if you have what we used to call a job in an organization where you work with other people, would you please put your hand up and uh, give me a wave? Okay, lots of you. Great, good. If you're uh, more of a consultant or a coach or something like that, would you give me, give me a wave? Some of those people. Well, look, host leadership it can be is useful in any context, 
where you're trying to work with others. And if you're working in an organization, then those other people might be your team, but they might equally be a project group uh, or your customers or your suppliers or people across the organization, people in other countries. Anytime you're trying to work with people and you think you have a leadership role, then you can start to think of yourself as a host. If you're a coach or consultant, you will find these ideas very, very useful also because you want to engage with your client. And if, when you're coaching, for example, you, what, one thing you really can do always is to host your client. Really make sure that they feel comfortable, welcomed, uh, have they have space, and the host and guest relationship is a very, very good one to start with when you're working uh, as a uh, coach uh, or indeed a consultant. So I think there's going to be things in this session that will engage uh, everybody here. All right. So before I start to talk about the detail of leading as a host, I want to just check in with you about what you think is changing in the field of leadership right now. Um, I have a few ideas about uh, what is affecting the view, people's views about how leadership work, works. But I'm interested, does anyone there have something you would like to put forward as something that's happening right now that's changing our view of leadership and how it might work? What do you think? <laughs> One said Trump. <laughs> it's changing. Trump. Yeah, well, yes. Uh, Trump is my is, is the antithesis of a host leader. He's absolutely trying to be a hero leader. We'll talk about these new models, these uh, metaphors in in a few minutes. Yes. It's a really it's a really class example of how not to lead, I think, in many ways. <laughs> But there's a reason for it, and we'll talk about that when we come to talking about the hero. The trouble is Trump isn't even a good hero, but anyway. Uh, we'll come to that. What else? Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of talk about self-management and uh, the new world without leaders. Yes. And, uh, because uh, mainly I think affected by the development uh, right now that the last 20, 30 years, uh, the techno technological development uh, is actually uh, is a problem for, for old-fashioned or, or traditional organizations. So there's, a, there's a, some, somehow a need for a new way of organizing uh, companies uh, or organizations to be able to react faster to change. Yeah. yeah, thank you. That's really, really lots of points in your answer there, sir. Thank you very much. So a few of the things that you said. First of all, um, Changes in technology and changes in, particularly in the way information flows. Uh, the old-fashioned models of leadership were very much based on information flow. And if we go back you know, hundreds of years to military leadership, um, uh, the idea was that all the information flowed up to the person at the top of the pyramid, the general or whoever it is, who was the only one who could get all the information and then was in a better position to make the leadership decisions, which then filtered back down again. And of course, now with modern technology over the last 20 years, particularly, the, lead, the information flows every which way all the time. And so leadership models based on information flow are really losing their, their potency. I think they used to have a power, but now the information flies so quickly that we can't have models based fundamentally on information flow anymore. That's the first thing. Then you were talking about uh, self-organizing or self-managing teams. Yeah, absolutely. And so this is a result, I think, of the fact that information now flies around all over the place because everyone can have the information in pretty much real time. So therefore... The corollary of that is that everybody, therefore, needs to make their own decisions based on the information. And so this is not a sort of centralized master brain model 
of the person at the top of the pyramid. This is a distributed brain model where everybody is making their own decisions, um, but informed, of course, by what's going on elsewhere. And uh, th this kind of thinking, I, I like this idea very much. I think this is about reprofessionalizing people's roles because the idea of a professional is that professionals make their own decisions, whereas mere workers have to have decisions made for them. And so I think the movement towards self-organizing teams uh, and this kind of self-management is part of this movement to making people more responsible for their own decisions uh, and, um, uh, and less reliant on having other you know, bosses uh, making those those decisions for them. And, of course, somebody still has to establish the setting, the context, the rules, if you like, um, in which these things happen, the way things work around here. And somebody still needs to be uh, looking after that because uh, these self-managing and self-organizing approaches do not happen in a vacuum. They happen because people want to make them happen and they figure out ways to support them. And I think that the, the leader as a host is a very, very uh, interesting uh, way, to, way to think about that. Whatever the rules or the approach that uh, your organization is taking. Um, there's this lovely, this very nice... Um, uh, distinction between the kind of the old leadership and the new leadership is the difference between a traffic light and a roundabout. You know this this idea that in the in the old method you drive up it's like a crossroads with a set of traffic lights and you drive your car up and if the light is red you stop and if the light is green you go and somebody else the light is making the decision for you and you're doing what you're told stopping and going but a roundabout you drive up and you look around and you see, is there something coming? And if there isn't, you go. And you make the decision on a roundabout, whereas the traffic light makes the decision for you at an old-fashioned crossroads. So it's about everybody being more aware and everybody making their own decisions in more like real time. There's one other thing I think that is worth thinking about at this point. We've talked about information flows. Uh, we've talked about um, self-organizing. Another thing is changing expectations of different generations. Um, in my parents' generation, uh, you know, you went to work and you expected to be told what to do. Um, uh, whereas that is changing and changing now. And so the different generations that are coming on and the millennial generation, they expect a different way of working. They expect to be more engaged. They expect to be more involved. Uh, and if they don't get it, then they will move. <laughs> and um, people now change jobs much, much more frequently and easily and readily than they used to, even when I started my career out 30 or 40 years ago. So um, I think good leadership is becoming very important in retaining good talent, and good people. And if you want good people to come and work for you and stay and work for you, um, then having a good leadership process, an engaging process in place, is uh, potentially really important. There's an old saying that uh, people join great organizations and they leave bad managers. <laughs> And, uh, and so you don't want to be one of the bad managers that, uh, that people are leaving, you say that. Right, so that's where we are in leadership terms in the big picture. So we want leadership that is engaging. We want leadership that is empowering. We want leadership that is about helping people make their own decisions and supporting them in that way. Now, I want to talk about uh, leadership as a relationship, not a role. If we, uh, we talk about the leader as a person, the leader as a person, but if, if you look at it, then have, having leadership must mean more people involved than that. There must also be other people. 
Uh, you can't be a leader on your own. That doesn't make sense. Uh, you can, you have to have some some other people, some followers, or, or something like that uh, involved. So I think leading is about a relationship, not a person. And I want to look at three leadership metaphors and look at what that means in relational terms now. So the first leadership metaphor I want to talk about is leader as hero. Leader as hero. This is a very, very old idea. And it's not going away. In fact, unfortunately, with Mr. Trump, it's coming back slightly. Um, let's look at, let's look at what, what makes a leader as hero work. So the idea of a hero is that they, they know more, they are wiser, they are braver, uh, they, they, they come on the scene, they sort things out, they save the day, and whether you call them uh, Batman or Nelson Mandela or whatever, they come along and they sort things out. Uh, Mandela, by the way, is a good example of a host leader, and we'll come to him again later on. But think about the, the classic hero, whether that's a, a, a Greek hero or a hero of modern times or a superhero like the Avengers films or Batman or Superman. All of these are, uh, these are, these are amazing people. They turn up, they sort things out, they brave. Uh, things are better than, you know, they leave things better than they found them, apparently. Um, and why, why, but why is, is it nice to have a hero? What's the advantage of having a hero come and sort things out for you? Yes. What's the advantage of having a hero coming and sorting things out for you? Don't have to do it yourself. Yeah. You don't have to do it yourself. Exactly. Exactly. So we love having heroes because we can put our trust in them. We can leave it to them. They'll do it. And all we have to do is applaud wildly. Right? Uh, and that's why people love to have heroes because it absolves them of any responsibility apart from supporting the hero. And this is exactly what happens with Mr. Trump. And he has these rallies when people cheer. Uh, and what they're cheering is that he will sort, that, sort it out for them and they don't have to do it themselves. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it, and, uh, this, is, this is what happens. So let's think about the relationship now. If the leader is the hero, then who are the other people? Bad guys. Well, no, 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 not the bad guys. I don't think. So, suppose we're in town and Batman arrives and he sorts out the villains. Who, who are the rest of the townspeople? Underdogs. 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 Maybe they might see themselves as underdogs. What is Batman doing to them? Saving them. Saving them. Yes, he's saving them. That's right. So the hero is the, is the counterpart of the hero is the rescued people, the saved people. And the role of the saved people is to be grateful uh, and applaud wildly and not ask too many questions uh, about how that happened. Now, in a, con in a crisis situation, that may be okay. Sometimes we, people need saving. But that is not a long-term sustainable relationship for a leader and their people to keep saving them all the time. Because what happens is that the leader ends up doing more and more and more, and the other people end up doing less and less and less. And so, therefore, this is not a model of engagement. This is a model of pacification. This is a model of... Uh, uh, on the contrary, this is a model that, that will end up with the hero having a breakdown. So, in the 1970s, there was an alternative metaphor proposed, um, which was about uh, 
uh, a deliberate alternative to hero leadership. And that was Robert Greenleaf's model of a leader as a servant. An extremely interesting model. Rather than the leader dominating the people, the leader serves the people. The leader takes their authority from the people. The leader stewards the people. And Greenleaf intended this as a deliberate counterblast to the model of the leader as a hero. And it's a really, really good idea. Um, it's unfortunately not very much taken up, and I'll tell you about why that is in a minute. But let's think about the relationship capacity, the relationship uh, factor. If the leader is the servant, then what are the what's the opposite of servant? The master. Right, the master. And if the leader is the servant and the other people are the masters, well, who is accountable? What's going on? Who's running things? Who's in charge? Now, Greenleaf intended this to be a puzzle for us. He wanted to. It's a paradox, and he wanted to make us think about what this tells us about leadership. Unfortunately, most people, I think, can't be bothered to grapple with that paradox, um, particularly in the, in the United States where the idea of a servant, people, people don't have servants anymore, mostly. Uh, I don't know if, I don't, you know, um, we don't have servants like they used to 100 years ago. If you've watched Downton Abbey, or something like that. Yeah, that was a generation where people understood what servants were. But now we don't have servants. And so people think of the servant as like a waiter. Or something. And that's a very, very thin version of a servant. Master-servant relationships are actually very, very rich. And we find that in literature and uh, in, other, in other places. But, but it's a difficult metaphor to understand now when fewer and fewer people understand what servants are or, or, or engage with them from either end, either from the master or the servant. So I think that, that although Greenleaf's work is very important, it leaves us with more questions than answers in many ways. So we have the hero and the rescued people. We have the servant and the master. And... Now we come to the third leadership metaphor, the leader as a host. And if the leader is a host, then who are the other people? What's the other half of that relationship? Host and guest. Guest. Yes, exactly. Host and guest. And this is a very interesting and underexplored relationship, I think. Um, because hosts uh, are both the first and the last. And sometimes they act as servants and hosts serve their guests quite clearly. But other times hosts act more like heroes and they have to protect their guests. And this is one of the very interesting aspects I discovered in my research about, about hosting and guesting is this, uh, this, this idea that a key role of the host is to protect their guests. So if, if you have guests in your house and somebody comes to the door, you're supposed to protect your guests. And this is a universal cultural thing. It happens in all cultures. Uh, and uh, so the, the, if we say, if, we, if, if you say, here's the hero and the rescued people, and here's the servant and the master, we have the guest, then the host is both below the guest serving them and above the guest protecting them. It's a very, very interesting and flexible relationship, which requires both parties to do something. Uh, and so... When I first thought, heard this quote of the host is both the first and the last, I drew a triangle. And the triangle had hero in this corner and servant in this corner and host at the top. Because I think hosts have to be servants 
and occasionally somewhat heroic. And it all depends on the context which they do. So host and guest is the leadership relationship that I want to explore with you uh, today. So before we do that, though, I would like to get a little activity going. I'd like you to get into groups of about four uh, and think about what do good hosts do? What do good hosts do? So we're going to have groups look at this three questions. And so uh, Jesper and the team there, you're going to help me split people into basically three sets in groups of four. One group is going to think about what do good hosts do before a great party? And the second lot are going to think about what do good hosts do during a great party, which is different. And the third group are going to think about what good hosts do after a great party. Okay. So, you want them to sit down again? Uh, yes, please. You want them to jump? <laughs> so, uh, well done, everybody. I'd like to, um, just to get a sense of what you've been talking about, I'd like everybody, uh, let's go along the rows, starting uh, at the front row on the, uh, my, my right-hand side, so your left-hand side person, yes. Yes, you, you, the lady, the lady, yes, the lady waving her arms around, right. So we're going to come, I want everybody to say one thing that a good host does that was in their discussion that they think is important. Uh, and of course, the, the groups are all mixed up, so we'll be getting different things from everybody. But just say, if you can say it in English, that's great. If you'd rather say it in Danish, say it in Danish. Uh, but I want one thing from everybody, and we're going to go really quick fire along the along the roads so yes please start us off okay uh, you have to first have an idea what it's, uh, what's the party right an idea what the party is fantastic next please and i was in a group about during the party and uh one of the things we talked about was setting the frame so everyone knows what's going to happen right everyone knows what's going to happen good next uh, you uh, after the party you reflect reflect over what was funny, what was nice, what was yes. useful. Excellent, thank you. You have to make an invite uh, that set the yes. frame about uh, where where do you have to yes. party. Yes, absolutely. Invite people is really important. Next, please, the lady on the on the uh, yes. Uh, during yes, the you. Um, you need to uh, be attentive to the neighbours. <laughs> yes, good one, <laughs> gentleman in the white shirt. Yes, uh, after the party, reach out to your guest uh, to uh, get a feeling of uh, what's that taking away. Excellent. Lady in the orange jumper. Just before the party, uh, you, can, you can settle on what the expectation is to your guest. Yes, nice one. Lady behind in the stripy top. Before the party, you had to decide who is the guest. Yes, definitely. Good. So we're going to come back down this row. Who's the next one? Yeah. After the party, the host has to have intentions. Yes, very important. Next, please. During the party, be careful to not take the whole picture. Yes, <laughs> taking the whole picture, standing back and looking at the whole picture. Very good. Uh, before the party, uh, yeah, economic. <laughs> Uh, the financial aspect of having a party. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, absolutely, good one. Next, cross the line. Uh, invite uh, nice people who like to be together. <laughs> Ideally, yes. <laughs> yeah, for sure, nice one. Sir, why in <laughs> yeah, keep people keep people uh, engaged. Yes, for sure. Next, please. During the party, you have to pay attention to everybody. Yes, you do. Very nice, particularly anyone who's becoming disengaged. Yeah. 
so who's next, please? After the party, say thank you. Yeah. Surprisingly few leaders do that. Next. Uh, before the party, you have to, uh, to be aware if you want to potluck or swing your course. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, during the party, uh, make sure to be open to people. Yeah, very, very important. Right, when you want to stay on the Thank you. Next. <laughs> well, you've got to look like look like somebody. Yes, that's right. Next, please. Yeah. So serve people, get them something to drink. Yes. Yes. Make sure they have what they need. Yes. Yeah, during the past, yeah. physical and mental presence. <laughs> yes. Good. Are we? Is that everybody? After the party, taking learning out of the success that we get. Yes. 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 Thank you. yes. <laughs> okay. Well, look, thank you, everybody. That's that's terrific. Very, very good. And that those are the kinds of things that people always say when I ask them this question. Now, what we're going to do in a moment is convert, what does that mean in terms of leadership? Um, uh, and uh, I would just want to tell you uh, one or two things about hosting that, that in order to sort of set us up for this. First of all, hosting is, it happens in every culture in the world. It's important in every religion. It's important in every spiritual tradition. And it's important not simply in terms of how we greet and meet our friends, which is what we've been thinking about in the activity, but how we meet and greet strangers. <laughs> the word host comes from an ancient Indo-European word, hosti, and Indo-European was the language before any of the European languages, any of the Romance languages were invented. Hosti, which means in ancient Indo-European, host and guest and stranger all in one. And this question is how you, uh, how you meet strangers. How do you meet strangers as uh, people to be afraid of and fight? and repel, or do you meet strangers as people to be welcomed and engaged with, at least to start with, so you can get to know them better? And hosting cultures first started way back in history, when in places where the going was very tough, very tough conditions, places like the desert, the steppes, the tundra in the Arctic, um, these places where life was very hard. And they evolved, the people in those places evolved a hosting culture. Whereas if you, where if you met a stranger, the first thing you did was offer them shelter and food and drink uh, and um, so before you even asked who they were or where they were going. And that culture still survives in, in some places. I've been out into the desert in Egypt to talk with the Bedouin Arabs of that part of the world. They still do this. Every, whenever you meet a stranger, you must welcome. Um, so although we think of hosting as being about inviting our friends around, which it is, it's also this much bigger picture of how do we engage with strangers. Uh, and it's a great... Uh, it's a great and very long tradition acting as the host, and it requires us to meet people in a constructive way rather than a defensive way. So this is a bigger question than it might first appear. The other thing I want to draw your attention to is, the, is a famous quote from Queen Victoria of, of my country, she was the, the monarch of the United Kingdom from uh, 1837 to 1901. And uh, she met many prime ministers, including two particular characters 
who took turns to be prime minister during her reign, William Gladstone and Benjamin Disraeli. And she had dinner with them both many times. And Queen Victoria wrote in her own diary about her reflections on their, their hosting styles. And she wrote, when I have dinner with Gladstone, I come away with the idea that he is the most clever, witty, and sophisticated person in the country. But when I have dinner with Disraeli, I come away with the idea that I am the most clever, witty, and sophisticated person in the country. <laughs> and I think this tells us very quickly that Disraeli was the better host. Because it's not the role of the host to show off and be the star of the thing. It's the role of the host to help your guests to feel like the stars of the thing and to feel supported and appreciated and encouraged. Uh, and those of you who work here, who know about solution-focused practice, will see a connection here about uh, helping, helping the other per person, the other people, to look good. Uh, as in our role as leaders. So the hero wants to be the star of the show. The host wants to help other people to be the star of the show and support them in that. So that's a couple of things about hosting. It's to stretch our under understanding, excuse me, of uh, what we're talking about. Right. Let's start to connect this with actual leadership things then. First thing, I want you to each individually think about a leadership challenge that you have. You are either you are facing right now or is coming up. And when this is, I say leadership, it, it, it can be anything to do with working with other people. So this might be a, a project you're working on or something you're going to have to implement or a thing you want to, you want to improve um, that's about working with other people. So I'd like you to take two minutes now to think on your own about a specific challenge you're facing and then make, give it a name, make a note of it somewhere and give it a name, uh, this challenge. And then we're going to work with it as host leaders. So two minutes to think about a challenge, please. Questions. I'm going to try and share a slide with you. We're going to put you in the position of the host. Of this situation. Now, one of the great learnings I've had over the last 15 years is that you don't actually need to be a host to think of yourself as the host. So you're going to be thinking of yourself as the host. And now I am going to try and share a slide here because it, this will be easier if we you can see the instructions. So can you see the slide there which says, who are your guests? Yes. Yeah, right. So think of yourself as the host. Now, the first question is, who are your guests in this situation? And I want you to think widely because there may be more of them and more groups of them than you first thought. So let's take one, mo one minute to think in this challenge, if I am the host, who are my guests? And again, make a little note of that, please. One minute to think about who are your guests. And when you've thought about who are your guests, then there's some more questions to think about. So how well are you looking after them at the moment? What are, they, what are you doing well? What do they need? And what would you like to improve in terms of uh, how you are treating them and encouraging them to do what you're hoping they will do? So I'm going to give you <coughs> two minutes to think about how you can look after your guests even better to help them in this project. And when you've got a few ideas about that, 
I'd like you to pair up with somebody and just have a little have a little chat about your situation, who your guests are, and how you could make sure they have what they need in a good way. So just a couple of minutes to pair up with the neighbor and just share your ideas, share what you've been thinking about uh, with, with your partner and partner look interested and ask intelligent questions about to help your, your, your partner to uh, extend their thinking in whatever way. Okay, so two minutes. Yes. So hello, everybody. So I hope that's been an interesting discussion. We have a few minutes left before lunch. And so there's an opportunity now for any questions or any comments that anyone would like to, to raise before we finish off. We, what we've done today is look at the metaphor of leading as a host. There's a whole bunch more stuff around this in the, uh, in the, the book. Uh, um, but this is the first step. So questions and comments, please. Yeah, yes. Uh, yes, so uh, I like this idea of hosting. I think it's, it's a good concept and metaphor to play with this. Who's serving who? What are the roles? Who's protecting who? Who is having intentions on whose behalf? Uh, but I think a key thing for me in leadership is you have to have an intention. You want something to happen. Yes. And you yes. need to recruit someone to take part in that. So yes. well, what's the distinction in your mind of, you know, I'm typically training people in facilitating. And I would tell them, you cannot have intentions on what you're facilitating. If you have, you have to come up front. Otherwise, you are manipulative in facilitating. On the other hand, the leader needs to be the host to gather people, connect, engage, tap into, but at the same time have intention of where we're heading. So your thoughts on this? Absolutely. I think it's a really, really interesting question that you've raised. So... That there's three things you've mentioned. You've mentioned the leader, the facilitator, and the host. And those are different. So as a leader, yes, I think you usually have an intention, something you want to improve, something you want to do, something you want to, to, to achieve. Uh, and, and that's exactly the same as the host thinking about what kind of party do I want. So I think as a host, it's quite okay to have an intention. I think you should be open about it and you should be open to change it uh, in the light of what happens. I think hosting is a very uh, uh, context specific uh, activity. Um, but there is a difference between hosting and facilitating, I think, uh, which is that, um, as you say, usually facilitators are taught not to have a, a content intention, although they will usually have process ideas that they will be, be, be putting forward. So in a way, this is one of the things about hosting is that they, they, are, they are both kind of facilitating and they have uh, an idea about the content. Uh, and I think that that's what makes hosting very, very interesting in that sense. Uh, you are bringing people together to do something. Um, and so it's not the same as facilitating, although there's a lot of good, you know, good facilitation skills will be very useful uh, as, a, as a host, I think. Um, but you're, you're, there's a poem by Walt Whitman where he talks about being in the game and out of the game at the same time. And, and I think that connects very strongly with, uh, with the idea of hosting. So thank you. That's a, and, and you're right. This is not the end of this, of this subject. This subject could go out, you know, we could talk about this for a very long time. Um, but it is, so I think there's a good distinction there between hosting and facilitating that you're helping us to make. Here. Thank you. Another question? Uh, other thoughts? Um, you are, in your book, you are talking about this uh, thing about going into the kitchen. Yes. And I like that uh, metaphor also for having at some times to reflection. Today we have a lot of uh, manager and leaders uh, connecting together here. Can you give us uh, some few words to the kitchen? Yes. So the book, uh, the book has, um, there's a metaphor and a model of host leadership. And we've talked about the metaphor today because we only have an hour. The model contains six roles and four positions 
for a host leader. And one of those uh, positions is called in the kitchen. And uh, the kitchen is the place in our model, which is a private place. You know, when you're having people around to dinner, you, the people are in the dining room or something, but the kitchen is your place. And um, what that translates as is um, that as a leader, it's important to have a private space that you can go to, which is behind the scenes, as it were, where you're not on full public display, where you can think, you can reflect, you can perhaps have some coaching, you can talk to some trusted advisors or mentors. You can kind of just take your shoes off and, and have a have a, a think uh, and a reflection for yourself without having to do it with everybody else. You, know, you can reflect with everybody else as well. Um, and that's a different thing, you know, to reflect in a town hall meeting or something. That's good. But, but leaders need a private place. And we think that this is... The feedback I get again and again going around the world talking about this is that most leaders recognize the value of a private place to reflect and, and, and learn and so on, but they realize they don't do it nearly enough. And uh, so the, the challenge is to find a time, maybe a time in the week or a time in the month to, to take time out away from the busyness because we're all busy people to to do this kind of reflection and that's why many leaders like to hire a coach or a a, a mentor which gives them an enforced time <clears throat> maybe once a month to, to take time out uh, and have a think about that so um there's there's lots more about that in in the uh, the host book this is the book that came out five years ago and has all these models i'm very excited to be able to tell you about the new book which is coming out next Tuesday. So you're some of the very first people to see this. This is the host leadership field book, uh, which has uh, 30 chapters of different experiences from around the world of using host leadership ideas in many, many contexts. Uh, and we're very, very excited. It was only uh, started at the end of June, and it's already, this is the very first, first uh, actual copy. It arrived yesterday here, mm -hmm. and I'm very excited about it. So... That's being published next Tuesday, uh, and so there'll be news about that coming out. Um, but if you're at all interested, uh, both of both of these books, if I may say, they, obviously the, this new one is a companion to the old one, <laughs> and as you see, they they you know you can see the connection just by looking at the cover there. <laughs> but they're both they're both very well worth uh, worth having a look at. Okay, so I think one maybe one last question or. Or otherwise, we will thank did, you. Did the, did the guy at the front in the white shirt have an extra question? He was waiting. Oh, I always have an extra question, but uh, it, it was uh, it was going back to your talk about the leader as a hero when you mentioned Trump, and I think Trump is a good case since we all have a kind of a relation to him, a virtual relation to him, or Twitter wise. Uh, I'm not sure I agree that he is a hero in that sense, no. and you know, if we talk back to this about power and your military metaphor of using knowledge, getting up and making decisions. In my mind, he's more kind of a clan leader. He's kind of bypassing knowledge. He's creating emotional bonds in the rallies. He is uh, simplifying a world that has too much information. Yes. yes. So at least he is a different version of this part. Yes, that's right. That's right. And and, and he's, you know, his, his, his base um, like him because he does this simplifying for them, um, but he's a bit, a bit, but he's. I don't think he's a compelling hero in the conventional sense because he's so plain, so plainly wrong about so many things. So yes, you're right, a clan leader or something like that. But but um, you know we've had we've had better heroes than him uh, <laughs> over the years, and I think hopefully he will be found out in the end. But he's trying to play that. Uh, and he's just not very good at it. That's uh, that, that's it's my. Interesting my part is when we talk about hosting, that it, again, as I mentioned, it would seem like facilitation would be good skills to have, but it's not enough because yeah. people are looking in this world for also all the skilled professionals and the younger generations for something to join in on. Yeah. They are still looking for a client. They're still looking for a story. Uh, to, yeah. 
it's not enough just to kind of facilitate it. They still need somebody that can uh, yeah. Yeah, make the patchwork into a narrative. That's right. And I think a good host can really, that's a good part of what a good host can do. You know, why should you join our thing? Uh, what's the meaning of this? Um, but it needs to be hosted. It needs to be, you know, there needs to be these ways of bringing people together in good ways, which is what hosting is all about. Um, so so, so it, it, the focus in hosting is on how do you bring the people together so they can do great stuff, not on deciding for them what they will do and how they will do it. I think that's that, that's a key distinction for me. So uh, let's be the last word and say a big thank you to. Thank you.